did a career. It's what she needed to do. It's how she was able to survive. And when you took her career away from her, she didn't know who she was anymore. She had no identity. For over 15 years, Clara had made no public appearances. Then in 1947, she appeared in a charity competition on the hugely popular radio show, Truth or Consequences, as the mystery voice, codename Mrs. Hush. We know that for many years, you've wanted nothing more than the privacy of your home and family. You voluntarily quit films at the pinnacle of your career because you wanted a normal home life with your husband, Rex Bell, and your two wonderful sons, George and Tony. You were very happy, and even the hundreds of fan letters that still pour into your home weekly could not sway you from this privacy. And we know for a fact that you are constantly turning down fabulous film contracts. Miss Clara Bow, or as she's... <laughs> has been uh, so happily known for a good many years, Mrs. Rex Bell. Let's... I want well... to thank the people who really made this contest, the great contribution it was for the March of Dimes, and that is you other listeners who entered the contest and contributed your dimes, dollars, or just anything. All of our thanks to you. But the public and private face were at odds. Clara was putting on a good show, while in reality she was, as ever, plagued by insomnia. In addition, she now complained of aches, pains and headaches, and was displaying increasingly erratic behaviour. A year later, she checked into a prestigious psychiatric hospital, the Institute of Living in Connecticut. A former psychiatric aide remembers meeting a subdued Clara in 1949. When I first met Clara, she was, she was pleasant, uh, sort of aloof, but, but still pleasant to me. Uh, she didn't talk very much with the other guests. She, she, I guess she didn't want to be disturbed. I think she wanted to be by herself. I think she was probably sad. Nobody's really happy to be institutionalized like this, but she seemed a little sad. The one thing I noticed, she looked very old for her age. I think she, she was in her 40s, I guess, when she got there, and she looked 65. Clara Bow's treatment for her own mental uh, health problems was really ahead of the curve. She was very forthright, always, and she would talk about it, and she sought the best treatment there was. She went to the top mental hospitals in America. And she would stay for long periods, often as long as a year. She received electroconvulsive therapy treatments, which she liked because she said, they helped me forget my childhood. That's what she told her sons. Rex came to visit regularly, hopeful of a cure. That support from him must have meant a lot to her too, because here's someone who's your spouse, who's being understanding both privately and publicly. She seemed very happy, and he seemed very happy to see her too, because I, th I think he felt that she was getting better. And uh, eventually, I guess, she did improve enough to, to leave the Institute. In her 10-month stay, Clara was diagnosed as suffering from schizophrenia. The intense psychotherapy sessions had also revealed some shocking facts. Memories came flooding back to her that for the first time she seems to have shared with her doctors, one of which was the fact that not only her mother tried to kill her, which she'd talked about before, but the fact that her mother had been a part-time prostitute when it was necessary. And the other revelation, which was more difficult even, was that her father, after her mother had been committed to a mental institution and she was still a teenager, her father had raped her. That was more difficult because her father was still alive at the time. Despite this, Clara continued to support her father financially until his death in 1959. The diagnosis of schizophrenia left no real hope of improvement, and it was the end of the road for her marriage. A return to family life in Nevada was no longer possible for her. And in 1950, Clara moved back to L.A., to a suburb only a few miles south of Hollywood, but to a very different world. Clara Bow lived in Los Angeles in a small, humble house with a practical nurse. Not a licensed nurse, just a practical nurse, like a caretaker. Clara's son, Tony, had by then married, 
and his wife Jackie remembers visiting her mother-in-law in the early 1960s. I never was overwhelmed with who she was. I think it was because that part of her life wasn't there. It was, she was a different person. A former neighbor remembers time spent growing up in the house opposite the aging actress. To us, she was just the pretty lady across the street. I, I can't ever remember ever calling her Clara Bow or Mrs. Bow or Mrs. Anything. It was just the pretty lady across the street. She um, very seldom came outside, and when she did, she was usually in a, like a, a, a bathrobe or night robe. She always had sunglasses on. Her hair was always made up. She hair was always done well, and she would sit on the porch and uh, smoke a cigarette. I know our Christmases together were planned right down to the to the wire, and we would have to. <laughs> But it was a tradition with her, and Tony had told me this, that that's what we do, and so we'd watch one of the silent films. She had an old projector. I know we watched one with Gilbert Rowland. In the very, very back here, she has a room, and it was kind of the collect-all room where the photo albums and, and uh, knickknacks and stuff were. And she sat there with me and showed me pictures, photo albums, uh, a lot of, lot of different pictures from movies and family and friends. Um, that was probably the fondest memory. She read constantly. She was well-read, and, and it was a joy to talk to her. Although hidden away and protected from the stresses of life, Clara still had one problem that had never gone away. Clara had insomnia. Uh, she never exhibited any mood changes or, you know, she was never uh, seemed out of sorts to, to me ever. I assumed and never questioned it either, but... Uh, she got a shot every night, but I, I never questioned anything about that. Clara had remained amicably apart from her husband, Rex. His sudden death from a heart attack in 1962 saw Clara make a very rare appearance in public. I have a, a, an image I, I remember um, of her coming out of the house and, and standing on the porch dressed in the black memorial type clothes. And that was m one of the um, few times that I saw her actually dressed up. Within three years, Clara herself was to die in the house she had retreated to almost 15 years before. In the days before the funeral, fans queued at the chapel to pay their respects. She micromanaged her own funeral at home. She made a long list for her sons of what she wanted to be dressed in, the color of the casket, the color of the lining of the casket, what makeup she wanted. It's all specified in writing for them. So it was almost like the actress till the end. I remember the ride to Forest Lawn and people that were alongside the road up to Forest Lawn and the people outside the chapel. The whole thing was so surreal to me. It was hard for me. When um, Clara Bow passed away as a uh, memorial tribute for her to uh, all the neighborhood people, you know, the close ones that had some kind of association with her, her I believe it was her oldest son, uh, set up a projector and screened one of her movies. 
and I believe it was the It Girl. And uh, I remember uh, sitting on the floor uh, with the other couple of the neighborhood kids, my mom and dad, and a few of the other mom and dads in the living room and uh, watching the movie. And that was the last, uh, the last recollection that I had. That was uh, her son thanked everybody. And, um, and you know, end of the chapter, you know. Clara's seclusion, her early death, and the lack of recognition for silent film created a void. I think the fact that Clara Bow's career ended so early and then she vanished from the spotlight so completely had a lot to do with her uh, disappearing from the public consciousness. And so many of her films vanished too. Uh, that was a kind of a one-two punch. By the time she died, Clara was so forgotten that she was even overlooked by film historians. Kevin Brownlow failed to mention her in his 1960s appraisal of silent cinema, The Parade's Gone By, much to the displeasure of Clara's contemporary, Louise Brooks, who fired off a series of outraged letters. And she would get so angry, and they would almost burn their way out of the envelope. And I could tell by the way she'd written, it was in sort of SS lettering, you know, lightning flashes. And... <laughs> and um, so I knew, oh, my God, I've done something wrong. But I do feel very sad that I didn't meet Clara Bow. A younger audience has discovered Clara Bow, and that's really exciting, but it makes perfect sense to me because, in a way, she's the forerunner of Sex and the City. She's the forerunner of the young, modern, independent woman. Clara Bow is the most colorful, delightful, wonderful creature on the screen, and I quite understand people will go on being fascinated by her. She comes bursting out of the period with all guns blazing. So after decades of neglect, Clara Bow's legacy is, like her films, gradually being restored. Now, out of the 57 films she made, we have over 30 including all her sound films. They've all been preserved. And even now, new clips turn up out of nowhere. In the past year, the long-lost color footage from the movie Red Hair made at the height of her career. The only footage of Clara Bow in color, with her famous signature red hair, has turned up. So it never ends. <laughs> 